Associate Professor Heather Jassine with us, who is here from Dana Harbor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, to the organizing committee for inviting me this morning. I'm going to talk about current clinical practice guidelines for PSMA PET CT, and so some of the information I hope will summarize what you've heard earlier this morning. These are my disclosures. So what are clinical practice guidelines? Well, there are statements that include recommendations intended to optimize patient care that are informed by a systematic review of the evidence and an assessment of the benefits and harms of alternate care options. Now, these are evidence-based, but it's important to remember that these are guidelines and they're not rules, and that there are also values and judgments that go into making the guidelines and also into individual patient care. Just as we assess every study that comes through for quality, we can also assess the quality of clinical practice guidelines. They should be transparent in process and conflict of interest. They should be made, the panels should be multidisciplinary. They should be balanced. There should be a rigorous systematic review of evidence. There should be very clear recommendations in the guidelines, and that stems from having very clear clinical questions when you start your literature search. You should rate the strength of the evidence. In general, randomized controlled trials are higher levels of evidence than cohort observational studies. However, within each study design, there are weaknesses and strengths that can raise or lower that level of evidence. There should be a rating of the strength of the recommendation. It is possible to have a strong recommendation with a lower level of evidence, and that just means that there may be some uncertainty in the recommendation and that additional studies in the future could change that recommendation. There should be external review of the guideline and a planning for updating. Uh, we heard about appropriate use criteria. These are a variant of clinical practice guidelines. They have the same purpose, but in general, they are, the panels are more specific with specialties managing the specific question, clinical question, and we heard that we use rating scale from one rarely appropriate to nine usually appropriate, and many imaging uh, societies use appropriate use criteria. So these are all the different societies that I found who are writing guidelines on PSMA PET CT. In the United States, primarily the NCCN and the AUA are the ones that drive reimbursement and also clinical, and pra clinical practice. I found a lot of collaboration amongst the European societies and a lot of collaborations amongst the nuclear medicine societies around the world. When you look at the guidelines, there are a lot of them and a lot of them to read. You can see a clear consensus that everybody agrees PSMA PET is the most accurate and most sensitive test for detecting a prostate cancer across a variety of settings. But we do have to recognize that there are not a lot of randomized controlled trials, except maybe pro-PSMA, with outcome data, and that's what really drives the guidelines. And so I think that's where some of the differences in the guidelines come in how the certainty and uncertainty terms that are used uh, within, those, within those guidelines. And the way the guidelines are written sometimes is to give a clinician a leeway to make individual patient decisions. So getting into the PSMA guidelines, there are four patients, they come into clinic, they have different risk, different risk groups. We already heard that you don't do staging for low and favorable intermediate risk disease, so none of the guidelines support imaging in that setting. If we then consider a little bit more the unfavorable intermediate and the higher risk disease, a little bit busy of, of a slide, but all of the guidelines agree that bone and soft tissue staging is appropriate in this setting. Um, in high risk disease, strong recommendations. Um, the NCCN very recently came out that you don't need to have a negative conventional or equivocal imaging before doing PSMA PET CT. That's really shifted the practice in the United States to do more PSMA PET CT up front. Uh, the European guidelines were a little bit more conservative saying that PSMA PET is more accurate, but you need to be aware of the lack of outcome, out, outcome data. And the SNMMI guidelines, which are now from 2021, uh, use appropriate use criteria of eight in these two categories. Interestingly, the lifetime kind of of a single guidelines is probably about three to five years, so 2021 is getting old already. If we look at the setting of biochemical and 
recurrence and persistence across the guidelines. There's recommendations that we should offer or recommend in most patients, PSMA PET CT, especially if it will change treatment or if salvage RT or metastasis directed therapy is planned. And again, major guidelines suggest that we can replace conventional imaging with PSMA PET CT. Uh, we already heard about how important it is that um, we are treating men earlier with salvage, uh, with salvage therapy. And so one of the main questions that comes up in the guidelines is what PSA level to get PSMA PET CT. And again, it's a little bit of yin and yang because we know that our PSMA PET CT scans are going to be positive uh, with a higher PSA level, but it's important again to treat uh, patients early as shown on that Kaplan-Meier curve where patients who are treated at lower PSA levels have longer uh, distant metastasis-free survival. The European and the Australian guidelines have a specific recommendation to do the PET scan, PSMA PET aft as a PSA level of 0.2. Um, SNMMI intentionally left out a re specific recommendation considering that PSA is not the only factor uh, that can influence the PSMA PET being positive, such as a doubling time, surgical factors, et cetera. The guidelines also, in, also, in addition to talking about when to do the PSMA PET CT scan, they talk about what you should do with the results of those scans. So again, in the biochemical recurrent and persistence setting, you should not abort RT if the PSMA PET scan is negative. Again, that's because tr treating those men earlier um, is important for outcomes. You should incorporate PSMA PET CT findings into the radiation therapy plan. Um, there's some extrapolation here from Empire One with the flucyclovine, uh, but it's likely applicable to uh, PSMA. And as we saw in the Oriole study, a little bit different of a setting, but men who had uh, all of their disease treated were more likely to do well. And there's additional studies uh, that are coming out looking at this. And then before local salvage and after RT or ablative therapy, important to biopsy lesions because of the higher false positive rate in that setting. There's a little bit more variability about the use of PSMA PET in the castration-resistant prostate cancer setting. Um, in the non-metastatic setting, uh, NCCN is recommending, again, imaging at that and suggests that PSMA PET is equally effective or better than conventional imaging. And um, the European and SNMMI is appropriate in most of those in settings. Uh, metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer, I think it's a, there's more recommendations not to do PSMA PET in this study, in this setting, because you already know that there's metastatic disease. What is the impact of finding several new lesions um, going to do? But I think as we potentially develop more response criteria and how to follow those men, these are recommendations that can change over time. There's clear, uh, clear agreement that everybody should have a PSMA PET scan before they are having PSMA uh, PSMA therapy, and then uh, RLT response, there are some recommendations that we should consider uh, doing that. But again, I think those are areas that are under active investigation. Just some perspectives from the United States. The NCCN does not support the routine use of FDG PET looking for mismatch, um, and that's based on there's no robust clinical trial data, and when they mean robust, they mean phase three randomized trials with outcome data. Um, they also suggest that we do contrast-enhanced CT and MRI for PSMA negative disease. This actually makes it very hard in the United States to do dual tracers, despite the fact that many of us, we believe all of the data that comes from, from Australia showing that we know there's prognostic information there. And so just in conclusion, PSMA PET-CT across all of the guidelines is recognized as the most sensitive accurate imaging test to detect prostate cancer across various indications. It's being increasingly recommended, recommended in clinical guidelines as a replacement for conventional imaging. There are still questions that remain about the effects on patient outcomes, and there are a number of studies that are now underway, um, some of which we heard about, to hopefully address those questions and really to get into clinical guidelines, you need that outcome data. I recently sat on the AUA panel for biochemical recurrence when they came out just a couple weeks ago. And if you could imagine studies like Osprey, ProPSMA, and Condor, which were the studies, and Lighthouse, which led to the approvals of these agents, they don't even make it through the literature review because they don't have outcome data and they're not randomized controlled trials. We got them in the guidelines, but still it was a little bit eye-opening that what we think are these major trials sometimes don't even get to the guidelines. 
endpoints. And so hopefully ongoing in these future randomized controlled trials with outcome endpoints will help us address these. And these are constantly being updated. So thank you very much. Thank you.